Michael. Um, I want to ask you about so many different things, but let's start with Ben Stokes' captaincy. Um, and a lot of people said, don't do it to him. Don't do it. When it became obvious that Joe was going to step aside, a lot of people said, English all-rounders don't make good captains. Um, and they said, no, he's most England's most important player. Don't do it to him. But I gather that he actually called. He was aware of that speculation. And did, he, did he not call Rob Key, the new director of cricket, and say, actually, I do want it if you want? Yeah, but only when it became clear that Joe Root had stepped down. He didn't at any stage seek the captaincy while Joe Root was still in charge. I think that's one of Stokes' uh, key attributes, loyalty. He was vice-captain to Joe Root. Joe Root's one of his closest friends. At no stage did he say, while Joe Root was captain, no stage did he say to anybody or intimate to anybody that he wanted the job. But once Joe Root stepped down of his own volition, which had to happen at the end of uh, the Caribbean tour and probably should have happened at the end of the Ashes because he'd, he'd just run his race, then Stokes rang Rob Key and said, yeah, uh, I'm ready for it. And in fact, there was no other there was no other choice. You could have gone for a short-term stopgap like a Broad or an Anderson, possibly. One or two people were talking about Sam Billings and various other candidates, but they were very left field. Stokes was, was the only man, and it came to him at, at the right time. He's 31 years of age, pretty mature. He'd gone through a lot in the build-up to getting the captaincy, you know, go back to the events at Bristol in 2018. So he'd kind of gone through a whole range of life's experiences and, and he was wise and, and pretty ma more mature than he was. So it came to him at a good time. It, it was funny, I, his first game after being appointed, so it, Rob Key appointed him in, say, April or late April. And his first game for Durham was at Worcester county championship game and I went I thought I'd, I'll go and see what he's like first game and I was only there for the first day and Stokes batted on the second day actually but he came out and he smashed it he smashed 100 I think almost before lunch and he hit a young spinner there um, from Worcester kept clocking him into the River Seven but it was a very interesting first statement it was almost as if he was saying this is what it's going to be like from now uh, and in fact, obviously, they took that into the into his first test, um, and the combination with McCullum has been um, an unbelievable one, really. I, I don't think anybody thought prior to Rob Key's decision to appoint Brendan McCullum as coach, people didn't really think McCullum was on the radar, or I didn't anyway. But the moment Rob Key said it's McCullum, I thought that's a, work, that's a stroke of genius. When you look what McCullum had done with New Zealand's team, which was this kind of transformation, which is exactly what needed to happen with England, and McCullum and Stokes were exactly on the same page, exactly the same kind of people, I thought it was a, a really good move to give McCullum the job. Joe Root has said himself that he's been surprised um, is a mild word. Um, <laughs> and when he's, you, you need to see him say, I've been surprised at his captaincy. I, I wasn't him to, to be like that. Uh, was there anybody, uh, apart from Ben Stokes himself and perhaps Brendan McCullum, who had any inkling of, of just how radical his captaincy w would no, be? No, I think everybody's been surprised. I'm not surprised that he's made a success of it, for sure. I thought he was the right man to do it. I never in, in my wildest dreams thought they would have this kind of transformation on impact I don't in any sport that I've seen certainly in cricket I've not seen as dramatic a turnaround of a team as has happened with this England team one win in 17 before the the new regime took over and now what is it 11 wins in 12 matches since so did that low base point enable Stokes to be so radical with his captaincy what if England had been middling Perhaps uh, England had gone through a very rough run. I was in the ashes. It was a really, really rough ashes down under. And then England were poor in the Caribbean. So perhaps because things were at such a low point, that gave him then a kind of almost a, a blank sheet of paper to say this is going to be a radical shift. But you have to remember that pretty much the same players. It's not as though Stokes and McCullum came in and said, right, we're going to rip up everything here. 
they basically have got the same players. That, that is the amazing thing about this transformation. It's the same players who are unrecognizable under new leadership. And the power of, of leadership is never better um, exampled than you know, what we've seen under Stokes. Stokes and McCombs. There's a lot, quite an interest, a lot of interesting aspects to it. I think intelligence always uh, interests me. Different forms of intelligence that people have. I, I've always thought Ben Stokes is an extremely intelligent cricketer, very cricket smart. But he's not academically intelligent. You know, if you if you talk to him about his school days, they were a bit of a disaster. I think he's got you know one GCSE in in PE or something, and that interests me because it. You know, in, in England, we can be a bit snobbish about intelligence. And I see a very street smart, instinctive cricket intelligence in him. Um, and it, it hasn't surprised me that he's made a success of the job. I think he will go down as in time as one of our very best captains. I think he's created an era already, hasn't he, that we've be spoken about in, in decades to come. I mean, I can see 50 years' time people saying that that was a period of, of in English cricket and perhaps in Test cricket um, that uh, that either I don't know that it will change Test cricket forever, but it has certainly changed it at the moment. Well, uh, yeah, sorry, just to butt in, I, I think there are certain captains, don't they, who shift shift the dial a bit. I think Clive Lloyd and the four fast bowlers for West Indies, which was a radical shift. Think of perhaps Steve Waugh and the very aggressive move that Australia made under his captaincy, and I see Ben Stokes in that vein as a, as a transformational captain in a, in a broader sense. Cornerstone philosophies of Ben Stokes' um, captaincy. Um, and I, I, for as long as I can rem remember, and I've been covering cricket, I, I know there have been captains and coaches who have always tried to emphasise the importance of the team above the individual. And, you know, the <laughs> for, for, for many, many years, uh, captains and coaches have said it's a team game. And they've always said it because they are. Everybody knows that you know it's a, it's an individual sport in many ways, played by eleven people on the same team. But Ben Stokes's belief that the team comes first before any individual, before any individual record or landmark appears, bordering on the fanatical. I'd agree with that, and it, he's lived it. You know that's how he plays his cricket, even w before he was captain. You know as a as a world-class all-rounder, he has never really worried about the figures. His, if you look at the bare figures for Ben Stokes, I don't know what he averages now with bat and ball off the top of my head, but he, they, 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 those figures don't make him stand out as a, as a world-class cricketer. But when you think of the impact that he's had in certain games, the World Cup final of 2019, the Headingley Ashes Test match, the World T20 final, you know, and the, when a game is on the line, he will drag his team over the line. But if there's easy runs to be had, he, he do, he's not somebody who's going to go in there and get a red inker just to boost his average a couple of notches. That's not how, how and why he plays the game. So he, he, it's in a way easier now for him as captain to drive that philosophy for his team because people know that he's not just talking the talk, he's actually walked the walk as a player. That's how, exactly how he's played the game selflessly and team first as a player and he's demanding that now as a captain when i say bordering on the fanatical um you know it's he, he would almost it seems prefer to throw his wicket away in the 30s on the verge of a declaration when when he could walk walk out it's almost on principle he's setting the example that that the numbers as an individual don't matter yeah and he's you know, the, the way he played today, for example, we've seen him play like that on a number of occasions since taking over the captaincy. And, you know, you could argue, well, he's a bit better than that, just giving his wicket away. But in fact, last year, because he wanted to drive this change, this transformation, was a cricket writer called Sheil Berry used the phrase, he said it's an excess of virtue. What he meant by that was Stokes is saying to his team, this is how we're going to play. And in order for that, to happen he's got to just go to the nth degree to the extreme of it as the as the personal example set by the leader um, and that's what he did right from the start of, of last year um uh, he's an amazing cricketer an amazing character uh, already an amazing england captain and, and will be so i think for 
some time to come. When we judge great cricketers, it's so easy to look at lists, isn't it? You, who were the great all-rounders? What did they average? What was the difference between their batting and bowling average? It's so easy. Um, he, he may well not feature on those lists. Um, no, he's the anti-Jack Callis in a way. You know, if uh, talking to you about uh, you know Cape Tony and Callis is Callis was a great player. Don't, uh, absolutely, you can't question that. But his greatness is very much based on you know the, the the kind of the numbers and the success, the hard won success that he had over over the years. You know, the thousands of runs, probably ten thousand, three hundred first class plus Test wickets, all those catches. But you don't think of Stokes in the same way. You think more about his impact on games and on moments and in match-winning situations. So you're right, it's not... The numbers don't mark him out as a great cricketer, but his effect on games marks him out as a great cricketer for me. Um, Johnny Bairstow, uh, we're moving on to some quick topics now. Um, we'll come back to Ben Stokes if you still have time, but... Um, Johnny Bairstow is obviously England's player of the year and um, will have to be squeezed back in to the test team somehow. And, and I think one of the reasons, you know, going back to this uh, philosophy of, uh, of loyalty to individuals is that's why Zach Crawley has been given, uh, given so much backing. Um, but when Johnny Bairstow, he, I think he's close to fitness now, isn't he? Where, where does he fit back in? Or do you not worry about that now? <laughs> well, if it was my job to worry, I'd be worrying about it as a selector. Um, these things have a habit of sorting themselves out. You know, a loss of form or fitness issue or an injury to somebody. And first of all, you've got to wonder that whether Besto will be fit in time. I mean, I don't know what stage his, his comeback is at. I think he was doing some light treadmill work last time. Last time I heard. And, and I hope he's fully fit and available and, and up for selection for the Ashes. I mean, Harry Brook, you can't, you can't obviously drop him. He, he's got to play. Uh, Root's got to play. Stokes has got to play. So there's four, five, six sorted. Um, and the, the, so the other options are top of the order where, you know, Crawley is struggling. People talk about Ben Folks, but, you know, Johnny Best has not kept wicket for a long time now. And on the back of a very badly broken leg in two places, is it going to be straightforward for him just to come back as a wicketkeeper? I wouldn't have thought so. So it's not straightforward at all, but uh, I guess, you know, things will sort themselves out closer to the ashes. Oh, I have to say, I feel less of a clown now because there was a point last year, right at the start of the year, where I saw Harry Brook get shed loads of runs for Yorkshire. And I said, he's got to play. This kid is, is such a good player. He's got to play. And of course, some bright spark in your position now just said to me, well, who's, got he, play, who's he going to play instead of then? So I said, well, Johnny Bairstow. And then Bairstow went on to have the most magnificent summer. And I felt, you know, a complete fool. But... I don't feel so foolish now because obviously Harry Brooks shown what he can do. Just before we move on to the Ashes, what have you made of Australia falling to pieces in India? Well, <laughs> it wouldn't be the first side to fall to pieces in India. It, it, it is amongst the toughest of places to go and, and play just because the conditions are so different from elsewhere. Strength and depth of Indian cricket. Um, and these days, the way tours are fashioned, as you know, it's just test match, test match, test match, test match. So if you start getting on a bit of a bad roll, it's very hard to turn it round because you don't have any cricket in between to get back into a bit of form. So me once momentum turns you against you on a modern tour, it's quite hard. That said, they seem to make some odd selection decisions, didn't they? Leaving Travis Head out uh, for Matthew Renshaw, who really struggled. They've got issues now at the top of the order with Warner having gone home. I, I know that Pat Cummins is not there for the third test because his mum's in palliative care. So, um, you know, they've got some changes to make for the third test. And what you, you never know, really, I mean, they're a tough and resilient lot, the Aussies, but you never know how much a defeat, and one assumes they'll get beat there, the only two tests in, but you, you're not quite sure about how that has an impact upon a t team, whether config confidence drains away a little bit. You've seen how quickly it can turn around with England. Well, you know, conf confidence can drain away quite quickly as well. So it's not the ideal tour for Australia to go on ahead of the Ashes, I wouldn't say. And they haven't won in England for a long, long time. They haven't won in England since 2001. Um, so I think they'll be up against it. But, you know, they've got good, tough and resilient players, an outstanding bowling attack and still two two of the best players in, in Smith and Labuschagne. 
Moving on to the Ashes, um, I didn't realise that that uh, there's a simplistic view about England's approach to Test cricket now, and that is they go hard. Well, I didn't realise until you up close and personal, you actually watch uh, what's going on outside of the restriction of a television view, television screen, how, how clinical it is, um, and how how precise. Uh, it, you know, there are certain like the Neil Wagner short ball. You know that he's got half his wickets with with the bouncer. Um, and they've come up with this plan, which is, in its simplicity, straightforward, isn't it? But it's so not test cricket. We're going to step inside and hook them for six over five. Yeah, eight. it's it, it's ultra aggressive, but it's not uh, without careful thought. First of all, the strategy itself, which is basically based around our best players or our most attacking players, the likes of Duckett and Brook and Crawley and these guys. And therefore, to pick them is our best chance of winning. So there's, there's kind of method behind the madness there. And, you know, yesterday when England were batting, Brooke and Root were batting so well, again, you could see there was a lot of thought behind it. They sat on Southie for the most part. and It really attacked New Zealand's change bowlers. So that is what they do. They try and soak up pressure, as teams have to do in Test cricket. But they also, when they then decide that it's time to go they go, they kind of go from first gear to sixth gear quicker than any other team that I've seen um, and that's what they did yesterday they were really went after Bracewell and Wagner and, and Daryl Mitchell the change bowls when they lost the first test uh, to South Africa of the Brendan McCullum Ben Stokes era um, a lot of people said well and m- me being one of them sat there in front of the captains after the game and said well did you go too hard and the uh, reply was no we didn't go hard enough yeah uh, classic, classic kind of McCullum Stokes psychology, really. Um, uh, similarly, when Root got out at Mount Monganui reverse scooping, I think that night, Brendan McCullum made a point of congratulating Root for getting out to the reverse scoop. It's that kind of reverse psychology. But yeah, they're they're, they're confident and playing good, aggressive, and smart cricket at the moment. And you know, people have said, people keep saying, well when South Africa came how will they do it against South Africa's fast bowlers and then after that it was how will they do it in Pakistan on the slow flat pitches of the subcontinent and now it's green seamer in New Zealand yeah so they've overcome every hurdle in in their way and then the the ashes is the thing that's looming will it stand up then I think so under pressure Um, if they lost an early test even an ashes decider I I think so Um, I'm not I'm not for one minute saying you know they're going to they're going to win whatever but I think they will commit to playing the same way um, and I think they'll put on Australia under pressure it's going to be a very different Ashes series I mean, I mean it's different in England to Australia and, uh, and they, as I say England have been highly competitive in Ashes series at home Australia haven't won one for 20 years but the last Ashes series England was so kind of tame and I was just thinking in Brisbane, you know, Rory Burns getting bowled out first ball behind his legs. The moment Leach came on, Australia just smashed him out of the attack. So England were England played timid cricket and were on the back foot, and Australia very dominant. I think it's going to be a, well. It's, first of all, it's going to be an absolutely cracking series. It is impossible to get a ticket, you know, for the for the games now, and that's part of the baseball effect as well. That people are eager to watch this team play, and that's got to be fantastic. What if Ben Stokes was injured? I mean, he. he uh, uh, Imagine Ollie Pope (laughs) trying to drive this this vehicle. Well, that's a very good question. I think a lot of it does derive from the force of personality of the captain. And, you know, well, Ollie Pope's not like that. Nobody's like that. That's the point that Ben Stokes is is a kind of remarkable character. But what he will hope is that. The ethos is so ingrained in a team that it can carry on. Already we've seen the effect kind of drip down into the Lions team, England's second team, B team. That Lions team, you know, they're scoring at a rate unheard of in Lions cricket. I think Jamie Smith got 171 balls recently for them. And it started to filter down into county cricket. So Rob Key and Brendan McCullum had a Zoom call actually before the start of uh, this tour with a lot of the directors of cricket in England and they're not telling them how to play but they're saying look this is how the England team is going to play if you want your players to be uh, knocking on the door they're going to have to show that they can play in a certain way 
So what they're hoping, I think, is to get this ethos embedded into the English game so that after Stokes and McCullum, when whoever comes next, can carry that forward. The World Chess Championship and um, the T20 leagues that are freeing up all around the world, I mean, it is still a bit of a schmozzle, isn't it, the international calendar? And it's so hard to know what to follow and what, what to, what to prioritise. Um, is there any uh, hope remaining that this can actually be resolved? I don't think so. I think it's a bit late in the day. Um, I remember clearly being here in New Zealand for the first IPL auction, which was 2008, a long time ago now, 15 years. And it struck me very clearly that this was the moment that the game changed and that test cricket and international cricket was going to come under serious pressure from here on in because once market forces drive the game, they will drive it in a very different direction. And it struck me clearly, even then, 15 years ago, that this was the moment. And what I don't think has happened is, is people haven't thought carefully enough about the consequences and they haven't planned carefully enough and they haven't been forward thinking enough. And I kind of think it's too late now. Um, but yeah, that's where we are. Um, I was looking back at some of the first test matches that I commentated on and uh, I have absolutely no recollection of the rest day there was a rest day um, uh, on some of those early chess matches. And it was a reminder of uh, just how much the game has changed. And I thought of how much it, it's changed. And I, I, I wanted to ask you, how close did you come in your playing career to considering a reverse scoop? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I, I'm so old that I played when there were rest days in test matches. My very first test match in 1989 had a rest what day. What did you do on that rest day? had a few beers on Saturday night. <laughs> um, but they were phased out very quickly. Only, I was only there for a couple of years in my early test career. And then, then you had a rest day on, on days like the Open, during the Open Championship and Wimbledon. So you had a couple of test matches in the season where you had a rest day. And then they were phased out very quickly. Um, did I, ever, I, I never thought about the reverse scoop because I don't think the reverse scoop existed when I played. I did play a reverse sweep once in a, in a test match against West Indies at Lords, but only once. Um, as you say, the game has changed dramatically. I, I can't think of a sport that has changed as quickly as cricket has post that 2008 moment that I mentioned. The game has just transformed and, and so quickly. Um, you know, T20 cricket, different formats, franchise cricket, just the athleticism and power of the players that you see now, the way that they hit sixes. I mean, Harry Brooks already hit more sixes than David Gower, who was no slouch, by the way, was a great batsman, David Gower. But I think Harry Brooks already hit more sixes than him. So that everything's changed. And that's the beauty of the game, that it doesn't stand still. It does change. And of course, as, as commentators and you know, people who are, who are there to describe it, the important thing is to stay with it and not just kind of think back in my day because th things were certainly not better you know the players are, are dramatically more athletic and dynamic than they were and which is not to say everything's better but i think it's important to kind of recognize how the game shifts and stay with it did some players still have half a pint of bitter at lunchtime during i tell you my very first test match as captain uh john embury had a pint of shandy at tea and i looked i said what what, what are you doing he said, I've always had a pint of shandy at tea. So I thought, well, who am I to tell John Embry whether he can, can or can't have a pint of shandy at tea? He's a great off spinner. Already had more than a thousand first class wickets. So he had a pint of shandy at tea. Fantastic. Michael Ellerton, thank you so much indeed for your time.